السلام عليكم Welcome home, everybody. It's good to see you. A uh, couple of housekeeping announcements. Let me go to the eye that we're at. I think we're at 60. Yeah. Okay. So a couple things. Uh, just because I tend to forget these things at the end, um, I wanted to begin by uh, first requesting everybody, inshallah, to make dua. Uh, you know, there's been, I don't know if you've been aware, but in the community, um, both locally, also uh, nationally, there's been a lot of loss, subhanAllah. So we have, you know, in Dallas, there have been two young men. I think one of them was in his early 20s, and one was, uh, you know, 17, and they both passed away. Um, you know, one of them, Safi was telling me, he attended one of the Roots Teens camps like a couple years ago. Um, and so this, this stuff, subhanAllah, just really hits close to home. And um, we, we, we say the statement a lot, but it's tough to sometimes internalize that you don't know if you're going to be able to, to, to make it to tomorrow or you don't know if you're going to be able to make it home when you drive home. And so oftentimes we hear these announcements, we make dua quickly and then we move on. But it's really important just to think about it for a second, you know, just number one, to pray for them, to ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive them, and to make it easy for their family, say Amin. And then also to, to think about, you know, the reality of your readiness uh, if your time were to come. Because none of us know when that time is. Um, and so that's number one. And then number two, there was a, a tragic accident of five sisters in Minnesota. All of them were teachers of the Quran, they were all mem they were all hafaz or hafidat. They had all memorized the Quran um, and they were teachers of the Quran that were well known. And they unfortunately lost their lives in a car accident, you know, in Allahi wa Nilay So we ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive all of them. And all those that I didn't mention, I'm sure there's a lot. I'm sure people could probably share uh, about, uh, you know, stories of, of loss personally and also, you know, in the network of friends and community. So just it's important again we come together, you know, we want to be able to, to benefit, but it's important to realize ultimately, as the Quran says, that, you know, that every single soul will eventually taste what death is. And the smart person is the one who acknowledges the reality and just prepares for it. Uh, the foolish person is the one who ignores the reality and then tries to like scramble at the end to like figure things out. So we hope that Allah Ta'ala makes us smart people and that we're able to prepare ourselves for it like we're doing by tonight. So take, take tonight's lesson, inshallah, we ask Allah Ta'ala to bless those who have passed with the barakah of this gathering and that all the good deeds of everybody here, that Allah Ta'ala send it, inshallah, to them as well, a copy to them as well, inshallah. So take tonight as maybe a reminder of a, of a self-check, inshallah, as there should be always. Um, so we have now entered into the portion of the story of uh, Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, where he is in a position of power. The tables have turned. And instead of him being the brother who was, you know, picked on and bullied and harassed and left for dead in the well, now he's the Aziz or the minister of a country and a place where he is the one who's in charge of dis uh, distributing and dispersing provisions. And lo and behold, his brothers arrive and they come to him and they gather provision. Now, Yusuf recognizes them. And when they go back to their father, Yusuf tells them in order to bring their brother back, their youngest brother, who was Yusuf's full brother, Yusuf tells them that if you guys want more, come back and I will give you more. But you have to bring the brother that you told me about that you didn't bring. Right? He's trying to scheme to bring his youngest brother, his full brother, the only other relative he has fully with his mother and his father, Yaqub, 
because he knows that he is also being harassed and bullied and picked on by these half brothers. The, the cycle is repeating itself. And so the brothers go and they tell their father that, you know, we, we need to go back. And we were told by this, this minister, this leader, that if we bring back Binyamin, right, the youngest brother, that he'll give us more. Yaqub has the same reaction he did the first time. And in fact, this one is even more, you know, it's even more, uh, uh, honestly, it's even more sad because he, he references Yusuf. He says, should I trust you this time like I trusted you last time? You know, when you said that you were going to bring my son back to me and you didn't. But at the end of the day, provision in a drought is still provision. And so he realized the pressure that was being set and the brothers ended up taking an oath with their father. Yaqub made them promise and swear by Allah that they would do exactly as he told them. And one of the advices he gave them was that when they entered as a group of brothers, when they entered, that they should enter from different gates. And we talked about this a little bit, the protection of the evil eye, the protection of people's envy and their hasad upon somebody, also not to draw attention to themselves. And then we entered or we got to this point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in verse number 68 that even though they listened to their father, who was a prophet, who told them, come in through different doors. When you go into the city, don't all enter through one gate. Enter through, through different gates. Because historically, cities had a wall around it with gates. Even though they listened to their father, they still, the destiny that Allah had decreed for them was still something that was inevitably going to befall them. And we talked about this. It's so interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this. That he says that Yaqub, he made a request and his sons listened, but what was destined for them was not going to miss them. And part of that was the lesson that when a person does everything they can, then when nothing goes right, they still know that they did everything they can. There's a layer of mental wellness that is found in exerting all of your effort. Because if you don't exert your effort, if you don't do what you, you know you can do, then when things don't go well, you always second guess yourself. And you always go back and say, maybe I should have done things differently. So it's interesting here that Allah is teaching us this lesson that Yaqub did his part, the boys did their part, but what was going to happen was bound to happen, which was what? Which was that Binyamin, some way, somehow, his beloved youngest son, the full brother of Yusuf, was going to be kept and was going to be held captive and he was not going to be returned to him. His greatest fear, just like what happened to his other son, Yusuf alayhi salam. Okay? So when they entered, they entered his presence. Yusuf alayhi salam pulls Binyamin aside and tells him, don't worry, it's me. I'm the brother that you've been hearing about, right? Because he was so young when Yusuf disappeared. I'm your brother. Like, I'm the one that you've been, you probably don't recognize me, but I'm the one. Don't worry. I know exactly what you've been through. I know what they've been doing to you. So he's telling Binyamin quickly, as, as much as he can, as fast as he can, he's saying, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to protect you. I'm going to save you. I can't give you all the details of what's going to happen, but ultimately I'm going to save you. And so then he goes, are we good? Oh, okay, don't worry about it. So then he goes, and when he gives them their provision, he slides what into Binyamin's bag? Who was here last week? A cup, very good. He puts an, art, uh, an item, something, something that doesn't belong to Binyamin, he puts it in his bag, okay, secretly, because he has a plan in his head. When they're leaving, someone calls out that a cup has gone missing from the, from the kingdom, from the, from the, from the uh, distribution center. A cup has gone missing. They have this huge, you know, uh, uh, little situation that arises amongst them, and they call out the brothers as they're leaving. The brothers are leaving, and they have no idea what happened. What do you mean? We didn't steal anything. So they say, what have you lost? Then the people call out and say, we have lost the measuring cup, and whoever brings it back, we're going to reward them with more grain. The brothers said, look, that's not why we're here. We didn't come here to steal a small cup. We came here to get food. So don't worry about it. We're going to move on, right? They, they were telling the truth as though they knew it because they didn't know that Yusuf salam, had in fact put the cup in the bag of Binyamin. Yusuf knows what he did, and he's setting something up. And we're going to talk a little bit about this, inshallah. So he asks them, he goes, hey, before you leave, hold on. Let's, let's get one thing straight. If we do, in fact, find the cup in your belongings, what should happen? 
right? Let's say you guys are telling the truth. What should happen, right? And they say that, okay, if you want, you can keep the person that had the cup, which was the law of the land. That was the, if someone was stolen, uh, they stole something, then they would be, they would hold that person captive or hostage. This is how we punish the wrongdoers. Then Yusuf said, okay, bet, as you guys say. He said, let's search their bags. And he goes and he starts looking in their bags. And then he said, this is how we inspired Yusuf to plan. This is amazing. The entire story of Yusuf up until this point has been nothing but twists and turns. It, it, everything that you think is going to happen doesn't happen. And then everything that is supposed to happen somehow gets redirected. And there's always just another plot twist. There's also another surprise. So when Yusuf does the right thing, he goes through difficulty. And when he does the right thing again, he gets imprisoned. And then when he's in prison, he ends up meeting these two prisoners that eventually become his long-term relief from prison. And then he becomes one of the leaders of Egypt. And now he's in the position of power. And so he meets his youngest brother and he tells him, I'm going to save you. But then he's putting his youngest brother through this whole ordeal. And subhanAllah, Allah gives one line here that's so interesting. He says, he could not have taken his brother under the king's law, but Allah had so willed. What does this mean? Well, do you remember what Yusuf asked them when he accused them of stealing the cup? He said, what should we do? You guys give me the ruling. Give me the law. Because according to Egyptian law, non-Egyptians could not stay in Egypt. Now we're very welcoming people. Ahlan, right? Umadunya. But according to the ancient Egyptian law, non-Egyptians could not stay there. So the only way that his brother could stay there was if the brothers themselves proposed this punishment. They said, okay, you know what? Like, keep him, you know, whoever stole it, because we're so, con we're so convinced that we're innocent that if one of us does have it, keep him. This was, the, the tafsir says, this was from their law, which was more of the, the Levant, Sham, because they were from Palestine. So they basically adopted their law and gave one of their laws to Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf knew that he couldn't do it without them saying that. So he lobbed them this little question. They gave the perfect answer back because the goal was to keep his brother. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he could have not taken his brother under the king's law. We elevate and rank who we will. This is a very important statement. Allah is giving us a little bit of reality here. How many of you have ever looked at somebody and wondered why they had their life the way that they did? Why they were better than you at something? How many, I remember, I'm 35, I remember when I was 21 or 22, and then they would, you know, would be watching a basketball game in the NBA, and they'd be like, so-and-so playing at the young age of 19, and I'm 21, and I'm like, wow, I'm older than that kid. You know, all he had to do was like just get someone else to take his ACTs and like now, you know, and be able to dunk. And now, you know, I remember thinking to myself, like, what a crazy, uh, almost like an out of body experience when you meet someone that's like at your same stage of life, but they're so vastly more successful in their career than you are. Like I'm sitting there watching this guy make millions and I'm like, I'm adding like a uh, uh, ground beef to my ramen. Like I'm a Michelin star restaurant and I'm like. You know, this is a hack. No one's figured this out. <laughs> Subhanallah. It's one of those things that just completely floors you when you realize that Allah has in fact chosen some people for something. And part of that is the second point. Allah Ta'ala says, وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٌ Every person that has some knowledge, they're always going to be outdone by the one who knows everything. If if looking at people's station in their life causes you frustration, if looking at where somebody is causes you confusion, like why are they there and I'm here? Why is this person, why did they get a house and I don't? Why did this person get this job and I didn't? This person's married, I'm not. This person, you name it. Why is this person in this position and I'm not, right? These are the seeds of envy. These are literally the seeds of hasad. Asking that question. The best way to completely extinguish that spark, seed is a, a bad metaphor because it's actually like a positive thing. These are like the sparks that's going to lead to the blaze of hasad. 
the best way to extinguish this is by realizing Allah knew something, knows something about you and knows something about that person and knows that what he ordained for that person does not fit you. It doesn't fit you. It doesn't fit me. Right? As I stand there looking at somebody who's my age as a professional athlete, making like generational wealth, changing their life, and taking care of whatever. And I'm like, man, you know, you guys ever played the but I'm Muslim card? I remember when I was a kid, like, why are all the billionaires, why is Bill Gates, why does Allah give him so much money? I'm Muslim. You know, you start to get all like personal about it, you know? As if like, as if like, Somehow, some way, you deserve that, right? And we've said this before in heart work. Allah withholds certain things from people. Why? Because it would destroy them. Because access to privilege could destroy some people where other people have the ability to manage it. They have the ability to handle it, right? It's why you don't give children the knife. It's why you don't let children play with fire because they're not wise enough or capable enough to handle those things. They're very dangerous. So when it comes to understanding how Allah distributes things, the most important element to get rid of all of the negativity, whether it's like resenting Allah, being upset with people, being, you know, having sourness all the time. You know, some people, they can't be happy for anyone else. Because why? Because they're always wondering why they don't have what they have. And, 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 and subhanAllah, being happy for other people is like a true gift from Allah. There's a sweetness in being happy for others that you can't find in being happy for yourself. Like, how many of you like giving gifts more than you like receiving gifts? That's an example. Oh, we have a lot of selfish people in this room. That was the wrong question to ask. That's an example of that. Some people like giving gifts more than they like receiving it. What does that mean? It's, a, it's about the ability to appreciate the pleasure in other people's lives without always comparing your situation. It's not a race, man. It's not a race. You know, sometimes I feel like when I'm talking to my nafs, my own self, I'm talking to my children. My kids are always like, let's race. I was like, <laughs> with what? Like, it's, it doesn't make sense. They're like taking medicine. Let's race. Who can? It's like, relax. Not everything is a race. But then you look at yourself as a person, and then you look at the person next to you who's in your, your bracket, and you see how they're doing, or how, and you're like, let's race internally. And subhanAllah, you just realize, man, that's not how this works. Allah will put people exactly where they belong, exactly in the place where they are most optimized to succeed, where they are primed to be their best. And so... Some of the brothers might be wondering, like, why am I not the leader of Egypt? You proved you couldn't handle it. When you were given a little responsibility, you abused it. But when Yusuf السلام, was given test after test after test after test, he passed with flying colors. So what a person has to do in order to come to terms with maybe why they don't have, I mean, this is going to be harsh, but if you really want to get to know, like, why I don't have what someone else has, you got to start exploring your, your, your vacancies your void. What do I not have that they have? And don't, not about, we're not talking about privileges. We're talking about maybe they, maybe, maybe this person is like regular in their commitment to Allah and I'm not. Maybe this person is the one who is like praying on time and I'm not. Maybe this person calls their parents more than I do. Maybe they do something in which Allah has given them this fadl, this favor, and I'm just completely void on that. Maybe instead of looking at them, maybe, maybe I need to look at me. There's some Urdu poetry. Should I do it? All right. All the Arabs, just relax for a second. All right? <laughs> What's the line? He says, uh, Mufti Kamani taught me. Let me remember. Umar bar, yuhi ghalti, karte rahe ghalib, dul chahre parti, hum aina saaf karte rahe. Which I think means, I was about to say a really horrible joke. I'll take the butter chicken with two nods. No, no, uh... <laughs> Which means, no, subhanAllah. <laughs> what it means, so the poet's name is Ghalib, and Ghalib is basically speaking to himself. Ready for this? This is heavy. You ready for this? I'm sorry for all you. I, 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 just, I just destroyed Urdu tonight at Roots. He's speaking to himself, and he says, he's basically proposing himself the question, like, why are you so upset that other people have, you know, this or that? And then he says, He says, you notice something on your face, but you keep cleaning the mirror. Does that make sense? You notice a blemish, and instead of cleaning your face, you keep wiping the mirror. You're like, why isn't it coming off? 
Like sometimes we want to project anything. I, by the way, I appreciate everyone go, ooh. I know everyone's like, rewind the last 45 seconds and delete that from the recording, right? <laughs> I appreciate your sympathy. Th th one, of the, one of the things that we have to get better at is not trying to clean the mirror. Just clean yourself, man. Just realize that it could be me. Realize that it could be me. One of the beautiful things about beautiful people is that they see beauty. And one of the ugly things about ugly people is that they see ugliness. Wherever they are. The Prophet ﷺ was able to see beauty in the ugliest of people. <laughs> Objectively. Like they were ugly. Highway robbers. No, no, no. Not, not physically. Highway robbers. No. Li <laughs> people like they were criminals. They were criminals, man. Arsalan, they would steal people's money, man. <laughs> Highway robbers. These were like people who were like horrible people. And, and, and the Prophet ﷺ would tell them like, hey, you're not that bad. Just stop with that. You know, please stop robbing people. Right. Or the, or, or the person who committed zina or like drank and he would, he would always find a way to like highlight the beauty within them. Right. So all of this is to say that when Allah Ta'ala destines or ordains something for somebody, don't spend time trying to figure out why they're so special. Try to figure out what you can do to become special, what you can do to gain that favor with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Okay. And then Interestingly enough, what happens? It's interesting. Allah says that Allah raises who he wills. But then the evidence always becomes clear. What happens when they see this? Instead of them being like, no, we know Benjamin. He's such a, you know, he's such a little kid. He's such a little guy. He would never do this. Instead of defending their brother, what do they do? To distance themselves. That's in quotes. Yusuf's brothers argued, well, if he's stolen, so did his brother before. Who's Benjamin's brother? Yusuf. He's standing right there. This is so awkward. <laughs> Yusuf is like, <laughs> and they're like, well, we're not surprised he's a thief. Comes from a family of thieves. First of all, when did Yusuf steal anything besides his dad's heart? Right, really? Okay? Like, when did Yusuf steal anything? They're just making this up. They're literally just ma they're fabricating this. They couldn't handle it. But you know what? Pressure always reveals who you are. It reveals these guys are just unabashed at this moment, unabashed haters. They're just haters. They cannot stand the fact that Yaqub, that their father, has some connection with anyone from that side of the family. And instead of defending their baby brother, like this is not, this is not like some like, you know, old seasoned veteran. This is a baby brother, right? Forget if he's maybe a teenager at this point. This, they're supposed to be a tribe. They promised their dad. They swore to their father. They've already gone through this one time. Like, you could come up with a list of reasons why this doesn't make sense. SubhanAllah, what do they say? They say, well, we're not surprised. Can you imagine how abandoned Benjamin felt? It's interesting because Yusuf was physically abandoned, but this emotional abandonment almost feels the same way. It almost feels just as bad. These guys physically left their first brother, and now they're emotionally abandoning their second one. Keep him. He's probably a thief anyway. Side note, as Allah Ta'ala says, that Yusuf السلام, he withheld himself. He held himself together. He was so upset. The tafsir says not because of their accusation of him, but because he saw them doing it again. It's almost like he was able to witness the crime third person. You know, the first time he's in it, he doesn't know what's happening. Now he's seeing exactly how these guys move, how they operate, and he is furious. But Allah Ta'ala says he held himself together. Why? Because there's a bigger plan at play. You know, sometimes we think that anger is righteous, that we have to show our anger all the time. And we, we mask that under the guise of like, you got to be you know, just, you have to be righteous, you got to show. Sometimes the right move is just to be quiet, move silently. Sometimes the right move is not to make any big statements. It's to wait and let things settle. Let the dust settle before you move. So then Yusuf alayhi salam, he held himself together, revealing nothing to them. But he said to himself secretly that how evil you guys are. How evil you guys are. And Allah knows exactly what you say. This is the statement of everyone who's been wronged. If you've ever been wronged before, you need to memorize this line. That... There are some moments in life, and by the way, he's in a position of power. He could easily have these guys tossed into prison. He could do it. He could make up something and do it. He's in a position of power, and he's like, no, you know what? 
Allah is going to take care of this. I don't got to worry about it. If I spend my life and my time giving up my mental real estate to someone who's wronged me, you know what? They've won. Right? As DJ Khaled said, don't let them win. Right? May Allah guide him. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Ameen. <laughs> I'm just going to stop there. So, okay. Uh, you know, I uh, the video of him at Umrah was pretty amazing. Uh, but you cannot let people who have wronged you dominate your life. You have to ultimately take that, that negativity that they've put in your heart and you have to hand it to Allah and say, oh Allah, I am ill-equipped. I'm a human being. I don't know what true justice is. I don't know even, oh Allah, what will make me feel better. Have any of you guys been wronged, sought justice, got it, and you still didn't feel good? It happens. You think you know what's going to fill that void. You think you know. You're like, okay, if this happens, I'll feel happy. If this happens, I'll feel happy. You don't know what's going to make you feel better. Ultimately, what you have to do, what will make you feel better? Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah, this is all up to you. I'm going to just completely and totally recuse myself from this decision. This is for you, ya Allah. And he says, you guys are so horrible. But Allah Ta'ala knows exactly what you're doing. Now the brothers, they come crawling back. And this is the nature, again, of the heart, you know, <laughs> subhanAllah, the heart that makes mistakes, like, like unabashed mistakes, will always have to eat its words. And the, some of the worst punishment of being a person of arrogance is that you always got to come crawling back. It's so annoying. I remember as a kid, <laughs> my mom's like, wear a jacket. I'm like, no, I'm not cold. Walk outside, you spend like a few minutes, and then you try to like sneak back in the house to take the jacket without her knowing. At any level, arrogance is just so humiliating. Because you're going to have to come back and eat your words. And this is what they're doing. Now, they realize, instead of them being like, keep him. He's a thief just like our brother. Now they're like, okay, hold on. Yeah, Aziz. All right? Yeah, you al Aziz. Oh, you, 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 you esteemed honorable leader. Right? He is a very old man. Right? Inna lahu abban shaykhan kabiran. That he is, he is a... a old our father is like in such elderly age esteemed please can you consider that instead of taking our brother you take one of us instead can we at least make that 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 trade because we don't want our father to go through this pain right but remember they've already said the first statement so there's a little bit of salt on that wound already yusuf responded he says no i don't know he goes who am i to take someone else. I love it. He's playing so smooth here. Super petty. Sometimes you got to be a little petty. He says, I don't know, guys. Do you think that we should take the other one? Like, I don't know. You tell me. I, I, we found the property with him. You guys you guys said he was a thief. He's, he's rubbing their face in the dirt a little bit. It's okay, a little bit. Not too much dirt. A little bit of dirt, right? He's going back to them and he's saying, look. Look at the words you have to eat now. The same brother that you just said was a thief, now you're asking to be kept with him? Now you're going to be big brother? Why don't you think before you speak, guys? Why don't you think before you act? Notice how much regret you have and how disadvantaged you are in this situation. Maybe, instead of calling him a thief, if you said this line first, oh my God, we don't know, he's such a young kid, it was a mistake, our father is so old, he's going he's gonna to just... He's going to faint. He's going to collapse. Please, maybe then you would have found enough sympathy where all of this could have been forgotten. But now that you've shown your true selves, I don't know who to trust. It's a really strange situation. Right? So then he says, I don't know. We can't really be unjust. You guys said he's the thief. Why would I keep one of you? The irony. Binyamin's innocent. Who's the guilty one here? The brothers carry the guilt from their first sin. Subhanallah. From when they left Yusuf. When they had lost all hope in him, in Yusuf, meaning when they felt like, you know what, there's no solution, they spoke privately. And one of them, the oldest amongst them, he said, do you not realize that your father had taken an oath from you? Don't you guys realize the situation? Don't you guys realize that we failed him with Yusuf before? Do you guys remember in the previous story with Yusuf in the well, what happened when they were trying to kill him? What happened? Who said that? There was one guy who said what? Don't kill him. 
don't, th- that's ridiculous. Throw him in the well. Figure something else out. The tafsir points and says that according to all accounts, it was the eldest brother who did this. All right? So all the eldest siblings in the room are like, see, my young siblings are crazy. No, that's not the lesson. The lesson is, there's two lessons here. Number one is that it's never too late to come back. The eldest brother, albeit saved Yusuf's life from being murdered, but still made a horrible mistake. And now he's coming back and realizing his wrong, and he's saying that I can't. I can't be a part of this again. Okay, that's number one. Number two is that he says, look at the, look at the, the, the mercy of Allah. That when the first plan was being plotted to throw him in the well, Allah didn't mention who it was. But now that he's saying something good, Allah is giving him that credit. And saying the eldest brother is the one who said, guys, think about this. So then he says, as repentance for my mistake, I'm going to make up for my mistake. He felt so guilty. I am not going to leave this land until my father himself comes and allows me to. Basically, this is his way of saying, I can't face him. I can't. I've already lost one of his sons. I'm going to lose another one of his sons. You want me to go back and face that guy and look at him eye to eye? Of course. There's no way I can do that. So he says, I'm going to stay here until my father himself comes and says, it's okay. Or he says, Allah decides. And this is a classy way of saying, until I die. I'll either wait for my dad to come forgive me in person or Allah is going to take my soul here. For he is the best of judges. You know, a lot of us, when we look at repentance, we look at it in one of two ways. We look at repentance as being too burdensome to actually carry out. Okay? I'll tell you a funny story about this in a second. Repentance, we see it as too much work to actually do. Okay? Or we see it as like foam on the sea. Super easy. Stuck for a lot, move on. I was giving a class and I mentioned that backbiting is one of the sins that if you want Allah to forgive you, you have to go and try and seek forgiveness from the person that you backbit. Okay, you ready for this? If you want Allah to forgive you, Allah will forgive any sin. But for some sins, oppressing other people, he gave those people the right of first refusal. That those people are the ones who have to forgive you. Okay, so we talked about this. We were reading it in the book and I was teaching the class and I said, isn't this so incredible? I said, why do you think this works so well? Because if you apologize to someone for backbiting them, do you think that you're ever going to backbite them again? Can you imagine looking at the eyes of a person and saying that I spoke about you in your absence? I said this about you and I'm sorry and I'm begging that you forgive me. That humiliation would reduce a person and you leave that moment saying, I'm never speaking ill of anyone ever again. You guys agree or no? It's humbling. It's humiliating. No one wants to go through that. Imagine having to go up to every person that you've said anything about, sit them down and say, hey, how are you? Good. How's it going? Good. It's been a long time, man. Let's catch up. Yeah, about that. I am the worst friend ever, right? No one wants to do that. And there are some scholars that say, there are some concessions that say that if you seeking their forgiveness is going to ruin your relationship beyond repair, then you don't have to put it to the test. Meaning, you should do some other things like praise them and this and this, right? You should repair it other ways. But you would not, I mean, you would not be shocked, but you would, it, it, it was so funny how many people after that class came up to me and said, do I really have to apologize? Is there like some money I can pay to somebody? Can I like, can I like build a well on their behalf or something? Like, and, and I said, why? And they said, I really don't want to. And I said, exactly. Toba is hard. I mean, it's easy to do it, but to bring yourself to it is very difficult. It's kind of like the gym, right? Like once you're there, you work out. You're like, I hate this. I'm here, right? But getting from your house to the gym is the hardest part. Tauba, once you're there at the doorstep of forgiveness, you say, oh, Allah, I messed up. And you tell the person, like, I- I'm ashamed. Forgive me. But getting to the point where you're at the moment where you can say that is really the hardest part. And so it's interesting here because... This brother, what he's doing to us might sound kind of extreme. Like, come on, man. You're being a little bit extreme, bro. Uh, Maybe not. He left one of his brothers for dead, and the other one got captured by the king. He He might be onto something here. But the point being is you could say, isn't there some other solution for him? Does he really have to live the rest of his days in Egypt 
And mind you, let me just contextualize this for you. Him being in Egypt, him living the rest of his days in Egypt as a non-Egyptian, not welcomed there by the government, would mean that he would be unable to work. He would be unable to live. No property would he be his. He would be what? He would be exposed to all of these injustices as a second-class citizen. And he's saying, I would rather do that and die than face my father. Don't run away from Tawbah because it's hard. Don't do it. Because the, at the mountain that you're climbing for repentance, the view from the top, the closeness you get to Allah is something you can only get after doing some hard work. I'll give you an example. My mom used to tell me, on the days you miss Fajr, don't have coffee. Everyone here is like, well, there goes my coffee, right? <laughs> Why? She's like, that needs to be your tawbah. Why are you rewarding yourself? Went to bed at, you know, two in the morning, skipped right through Fajr, woke up bright and early, working from home, from your bed, right? And then you go over and make yourself, uh, you know, a nice coffee. You film it on Instagram so you can post it later. Your 17 followers will thank you, right? <laughs> and you enjoy your really nice latte. Then you make yourself an avocado toast. And then you go and you, you door dash and you treat yourself all day long. My mom was like, it doesn't make sense to disobey Allah and then just go about your day like normal. Like if you want to change that behavior, if you miss Fajr and you regret it, then you got to take something away. You got to remove something. You can't go about your day like normal. Because then your mind is going to play tricks on you. You're like, you know what? I miss Fedra and Allah didn't do anything to me. So like, still got my avocado toast. <laughs> you know, maybe Allah's not that upset. Well, the reality is that your, your repentance is being held back by yourself. And some scholars would do this. I actually had a teacher. When I say scholars, I'm not talking about ancient scholars. My teachers, not Fedra, if they missed Tahajjud, they would sleep on the floor for the month. They wouldn't give themselves a bed. And we said, why? And he's like, I missed Tahajjud. My bed is a test for me. And we're like, yeah, Tahajjud, you know? <laughs> so hard to you know, miss Tahajjud, right? And my teacher would say, I'm sleeping on the floor. It is what it is, because I, I'm not going to test myself again with a mattress. I have to earn it back. I know that this sounds a bit extreme, but look, we're adults here, man. If you spend too much money on your credit card and you don't pay your bills, you got late fees. If you speed and you get pulled over, you get a ticket. The reality is, man, if you violate any of these things, like you need some of these things to bring you back. And so if I'm going to consistently indulge and do what I want all day long, all day long, and not like give myself some kind of like, okay, you know what? If I don't pray my five prayers today, I'm not eating what I want tonight. I'm going to eat lentils and rice. Some of you are like, I'm down, right? then you got to eat burgers, <laughs> right? Like, you got to choose what you don't want so that your body knows, like, you know what? I'm not going to keep rewarding you for disobeying Allah. I, I'm going to take this seriously. People take it real seriously on my fitness pal. They take it real seriously when they're saving up to buy a house. They take it real seriously when they need to accomplish a goal. Well, make prayer one of your goals. Make Islam one of your goals and see how seriously it becomes. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us tawfiq. Okay, so... He makes this pledge, and it's honestly an incredible pledge, subhanAllah. So then he says, return to your father, the oldest brother, and say, O oh, our father, your, your son committed theft. And this is not a statement of fact. This is him saying it seems to be the case. It seems to be the case that your son committed theft. We testify only to what we know. We testify only to what we know. We could not guard against the unforeseen. Like, oh, oh dad, we did everything right. We came in through the different gates. We brought him. We took care of him. How are we supposed to know that he was going to be caught with a cup in his bag? You know, we did everything we could. Okay? And to add further to it, ask the people of the land, if you want, what happened. They all know the story. They all saw what happened. So we're not lying to you, Dad. This is what they were told to go back to their dad and say. They get back to their dad, and what does he say? Qala, bal, sawalat lakum anfusakum. He says the same thing again. It's so amazing, man. The Quran is so incredible. If you scroll all the way back to when Yusuf was lost and they came back with the bloody shirt, he said the same thing. Your souls have tricked you again. And that's really what it is. Like when we do the wrong thing, we're just falling for a trap. 
we're just falling for a trick. Like we think that by doing this or doing that, we're giving ourselves ease or happiness or something. Reality, man, it just comes with a whole bunch of regret. So he's saying to them, man, you guys didn't learn, you know. But the irony is that this one's not their fault. So how can that be fair? Why is Yaqub blaming them for something that they didn't do this time? Well, reputation is a hard thing to clean, man. For, for those people who say, you know, I don't care what people think about me. Well, people care what they think about you. And ultimately, you can't be alone. You need people. And so if someone's looking for a job and you're not honest, you might have a tough time getting references. If someone's looking to get married and you're not known to be a good person, you might have a tough time finding someone to marry you. So this whole culture of like, I don't care what people think about me, we got to, that's not from Islam. We also don't only care what people think about us. But we know how valuable it is to have a good reputation, good character, to make sure that nobody can pin you with something, right? All Islam asks of us, as far as reputation, don't let people, don't give people the ammo to pin you down with something. Make sure you cover your bases. Make sure that you're not found in the wrong place at the wrong time. Make sure that you're able to, you know, tell people where you were. Make sure that you have the integrity. Make sure you have the, the group of friends that can back you up. Make sure that you don't have these hor horrific decisions that you've made with no repentance, no remorse, no regret. So when it happens again, ultimately, even if it wasn't you, people are going to turn to you. Like Ron Artest in the NBA with fouling. Right? There are some people just in their life, because they did something once, it, 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 it was they were scarred for the rest of their life because they didn't repair it the way they should have. Right? So he says, no, your souls must have tempted you to something evil. And he says, I've left with nothing but beautiful patience. Allah will return them all to me. This is amazing. He has been tested now twice. Not just losing one son, but losing two of his sons. And instead of him making this moment about him and how frustrated he is, how unfair this is, the first thing he says is, I know that Allah will take care of me. This is the, this is the personality of a Muslim. Allah is not asking him to, to tell how. Like, Yaqub doesn't know exactly what the plan is. The whole story of Yusuf, by the way, is that no one knows what the plan is, except for Allah. Yaqub is not detailing the exact strategy, the reasons, why. All Yaqub has to say in this moment is, Allah has got this. Tawakkaltu ala Allah. I place my trust in Him. Allah does not ask you to identify anything else. All He asks of you is to trust Him. That's it. And those who trust Him, those who truly trust Him, are rewarded with the fulfillment of that trust. And so He says, I trust Allah will return them to me. Verily, He is the all-knowing and the all-wise. Then He turned away. He turned. Why do you think He turned away? Turned away from who? From the boys. Why do you think he turned away? And he says, Alas, my poor Yusuf. And his eyes turned white out of grief that he suppressed. What do you think he turned away? Why? So the boys come and tell him, We lost our brother again. He has this moment. He holds himself together. And then he turns around and he does what? He starts weeping, he starts crying. Everyone always has two sides, <laughs> subhanAllah. You have to sometimes put on a brave face. And Allah is demonstrating here for us something so amazing. You're allowed to trust in Allah, but still cry. Your concern, your fear, your sadness is not a sign that you're a bad Muslim or that you don't trust in Him. It is part of your humanness. But you have to, you have to wrap that up with a bow of tawakkul on Allah. You have to clean it up with relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says that he turned away from them and he says, oh my Yusuf, and his eyes turned white. Some of the scholars said this is the moment where he lost his sight. Others say that he didn't lose his sight fully, but his eyes became damaged from the amount of weeping that he did. That he couldn't see straight. He, his, his vision was very blurry. Then they said, by Allah, you will never cease to forget Yusuf until you lose your health or even your life. Again, this is the guilt speaking. They're frustrated. They're upset. 
and they're taking it out on Yusuf instead of them realizing it, right? The lesson from these guys so far in the story is don't be like this. Learn how to own your L's, man. Learn how to take the L's. If you did something or if you were responsible, the worst thing you could do is try to figure out why it's someone else's fault. Just learn how to take that L. And they blame their father for having this. And then subhanAllah, he replies, I complain of my anguish and my sorrow only to Allah. And I know from Allah what you do not know. He's telling his sons that I'm not even, this isn't about you. It's not about me. You're misplacing your frustration. I'm just crying to Allah. You should not become frustrated with that. Don't become upset with me because I'm mourning, grieving the loss of my son and now my other son. And he says, I know from Allah that which you do not know. Then he gathers himself and he tells them, go and search for Yusuf and his brother. Now they know where the brother is, but remember, these guys still don't know who the minister is. They don't know that it's Yusuf alayhi salam. And he says, and do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah, for no one loses hope in Allah's mercy except those people with no faith. Even after all they've done, the father comes to them, a prophet of Allah, and says, you guys are still salvageable. That was a really bad word to use because it's like, you know. But you guys are still there. All you have to do is take one turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is waiting for you. He is waiting for you. Yaqub is like the eternal optimist. He's being tested over and over again. And isn't it amazing that what is Yusuf? Yusuf is also very optimistic. So it's these guys keep wondering why is Yusuf so special but Yusuf and Yaqub's personalities are so similar that he keeps demonstrating why he's so special. He took all of this from his dad. He was able to copy all of the beautiful traits from his father. Again, they're not able to see it because they're blinded by their jealousy and their envy and their anger. But if they were able to just push those things aside for one second, they would be able to witness the actual greatness that their father has and that their brother has. And instead of being jealous, they could actually appreciate it. And so their father tells them, go back and search for your brothers and do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They go back and they travel and they enter the presence of Yusuf, again, not knowing who he is. And they say, oh, chief minister, we and our family have been touched with hardship and we have brought what little wealth we have, a few worthless coins. We don't have much, but please give us our supplies in full and be charitable to us. Indeed, Allah rewards the charitable and now Yusuf asks the question out of nowhere you ready for this they come back and they're like please give us more crops and Yusuf says 25 years later or more do you guys remember your brother Yusuf can you imagine their hearts just sinking how does this guy know about Yusuf do you guys remember what you did to your brother Yusuf and his brother, in your ignorance? They replied in shock, is that you? Are you really Yusuf? He said, it is. I'm Yusuf, and here's my brother Binyamin. Allah has truly been gracious to us. How can he say that? Allah has been gracious to us. Hold on, pause. What did he go through? What did he go through to get here? How many tests did he go through? Think of the worst moments in your life. Have they passed? They've gone through it. And now you're sitting here. You're in a good state. Would you, uh, what kind of person looks at that life and says, Allah has been good to me? Prison only for 12 years. Left for dead in the well. Kidnapped in, in my, by my brothers. Haven't seen my father in two decades. Allah has been so good to me. Man, how much less happens to us and how stingy are we with that statement? Like less happens to us, right? A flat tire and we're like, why Allah? What did I do? You know, your Netflix login doesn't work because you got 19 people on it. <laughs> Allah, why do you test me this way? I can't handle this, right? You promised you wouldn't test me beyond what I could bear. Yusuf, this is, the, look at Yaqub, look at Yusuf, look at how they handle this stuff. The lesson here is clear. How do you handle difficult moments? Do you handle it like the brothers? They, they crack. They can't handle this stuff. They get accused of thievery. They throw their brother under the bus. Then they come back. Then they, 
They go back to their father. They tell him, it's your fault. Look at you. You can't control yourself. They can't handle this. Faith is what grounds you. Iman with Allah is what sustains you. Allah has been gracious to us. Surely whoever is mindful of Allah and patient, then certainly Allah will never discount their reward. We're going to pause here. It gets very good. We're almost at the end, inshallah. We're going to pause here because Maghrib, actually, no, we're going to go for two more minutes, inshallah. Okay? They admitted, by Allah, Allah has truly preferred you over us and we have surely been sinful. 91 verses later, we have the repentance. We have the moment where the brothers went from being who they were to what they can become. It's never too late. Allah never closes that door. Allah has truly preferred you over us. But they're not saying that Allah preferred them for no reason. Allah preferred Yusuf for a very obvious reason. Remember, when you see someone that seems to have the favor of Allah, always assume that there's something beautiful within them, that Allah has given, them to, it, given it to them for some reason. And then Yusuf, again, it, you couldn't write this better. Literally, you couldn't because Allah wrote it. There's no blame on you today. Could, could you have scripted a more Yusuf thing to say in this moment after everything he's been through? There's no blame on you today. After all you've done. Why? Because subhanAllah, when the, when the pure heart is purified and like really operating at a different level, you see even the tests as part of your success. You see the tests as part of your success. But the person that's clouded in their heart, they can't even see the blessings that Allah has given them, let alone the tests. There is no blame on you today. May Allah forgive you. He is the one who is the most merciful of all of the merciful. Go with this shirt of mine. Cast it over my father's face and he will regain his sight fully. Then come back to me with your whole family. Okay, we'll stop here, inshallah. This is a good place to stop. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us the lessons of the surah, and Allah, that Allah, he allows us to practice all of the beautiful virtues of patience and compassion and trust and reliance that Yusuf and his father had. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow us to practice the repentance of his brothers, and that we're able to come closer to him as quickly as possible. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow us to always have that, that feeling of certainty that Allah Ta'ala will be there with us, that no matter what we're going through, we will always see the light at the end of the tunnel. أقول كل هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولإسعاد المسلمين والمسلمات فاستغفروا إنه فرصين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك uh, just a couple of announcements inshallah I have to depart immediately I won't be able to take any questions unfortunately because I'm leaving town for three weeks tomorrow inshallah uh, so I haven't packed as classic me fashion um, we do have hard work inshallah next week it'll be uh, guest speakers, so don't worry. Please come, inshallah, enjoy the space. Enjoy that it's going to be better than me, uh, inshallah. And then we will have the July 3rd heart work will be off for the holiday. And then we'll have the following July 10th one will be back on, inshallah. And then I'll be back on the 17th, bi um, So I wanted to just ask everyone, inshallah, before I travel, that if I owe anyone anything or any, you know, whatsoever, please forgive me. I'm not going on hajj, don't worry. <laughs> it was a very hajj announcement. Um, but I, uh, uh, if I owe anyone anything or if anything's urgent, please just message me, inshallah, and I'll try my best to get it taken care of before uh, I leave tomorrow. And if not, I'll be available over Telegram, inshallah. Okay? Jazakumullah khairan. But I have to please ask for your forgiveness as I have to go because I have to uh, pick up some things before we pack tonight, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, inshallah.